Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our quality data harmonization webinar with uh, PWC and ETQ. It's great to see everybody joining us today. Uh, wonderful to uh, be joined with PwC to talk about data harmonization, which is a hot topic in, in the industry today because we have lots of data floating around and need to figure out what to do with it. Before we get started, let's talk about uh, some webinar logistics real quick here. Um, please, if you have any Q&A, any questions for the Q&A, uh, there is uh, a Q&A button in the Zoom widget, uh, typically at the bottom of your screen. Please just submit your questions there and we will be answering them uh, later on in the webinar. Also, we are recording the webinar and everyone will get a copy of this. My name is David Isaacson uh, with ETQ and joined by Tom Barlow, also from ETQ and a great team from PwC who's going to help us with this webinar, Christina Morris, Vishaka Rajaram and Bruce Kiesler. And uh, we will get into uh, the details. You'll see, we'll talk about trends and perspectives, some benefits of, of quality data harmonization, some examples, and then we'll get into a discussion and take your questions. At this point, I'd like to toss it over to Bruce, who will take us through uh, with the PwC team trends and perspectives. Awesome, thanks so much, David. So looking over the next three years, trends indicate that uh, companies will continue to invest heavily in digital transformative efforts, whether that's investments in artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing, um, or in the last couple of years, we're seeing the migration from on-prem solutions to cloud-based EQMS. Uh, so we were to forecast the next three years based on current trends. You know, by 2024, we actually expect about 65% of companies who have developed these automation digital technologies will introduce automations in their processes, such as artificial intelligence or machine learning. Um, by 2025, 70% of organizations across all industries will have engaged in some form of digital transformation, connecting automating processes to drive uh, towards a better database decision-making. And by 2026, uh, the market for software enabling hyper-automation will grow to over a trillion dollars. So that should put things into perspective with, with the growth, uh, the speed that we're seeing uh, from a digital perspective. So there's several factors that have kind of been uh, part of driving these investments, uh, growing volume of data, right? Uh, and that's coupled with the limited resources to support that volume. Uh, market dynamics are changing, right? So the market's becoming increasingly competitive. That's driving the need to get to market faster and companies are meeting that need with innovation and automation. Uh, environment uh, that companies are operating in is changing, right? Higher resource costs, uh, evolving regulations, and then finally, just advancements in technology, right? So we're able to generate better insights. We have more to, to offer. So in order to generate these insights though, data harmonization, integration across enterprise systems is a fundamental step. Uh, and these efforts, uh, it, it needs to be, uh, we need to take that fundamental step in order to gain that foothold and be able to produce those meaningful results. So one of the first things we wanted to lead into is with uh, to understand from the audience here uh, using a poll, kind of what, um, you know, what, what are the expectations? How are uh, your organizations involved with, uh, or, or are they involved with digital transformation efforts? So you should see a poll pop up on your screen here. If you could take a minute to uh, answer some of those, and then we'll, we'll uh, transition over into, uh, I think we'll hand it off to Vishaka here to take us through a little, a little bit more detail about um, some of our perspectives uh, and why we're, we're sort of forecasting some of this growth. So we'll go ahead and transition over into the next one. I don't know if we uh, see the poll pop up here.
So I'm not sure if we'll be able to share. Oh, perfect. Here we go. It just came up on my screen. Uh, so we're seeing uh, uh, interesting, interestingly enough, right? 46% actively implementing another 29 and then planning stages, 26 in the nose. So something to keep in mind as, as you're listening today, especially if you're in that, you know, that no category, you know, you, you have a control of your organization, you're able to you know, offer up uh, you know, your, your perspectives and certainly uh, it's worth uh, noting the, the, the overall trend across uh, all industries. Uh, so Vishaka, maybe I'll hand it over to you to dive in a little bit more about our perspectives uh, from a digital Yeah, point. Thank, thanks, Bruce. I think the numbers that we just saw in terms of the organizations actively implementing um, or actively engaged in a digital transformation effort is, is not unusual. Um, we are seeing, for the reasons Bruce mentioned earlier, a number of companies may, starting to contemplate or actively engage in evolving from on-prem to cloud-based and otherwise um, transition from um, you know, paper or manual systems into electronic systems. So as we think about that transition from a digital quality lens, uh, there are a couple of things I wanted to highlight. Um, starting with the framework you see on the left. Uh, the first is it, it takes an integrated approach. Um, so for those of you that are actively engaged in an implementation, this is probably uh, something you're going through as we speak. Um, much the same way as processes and procedures by themselves are not enough to ensure quality, it's the same with technology. You might be implementing something state of the art, but it does require the right governance and controls, the right roles, the right qualifications, and specifically relevant to our discussion today, the right data models, uh, harmonized data models, in order to actually harness the power of that technology. We've seen um, numerous polls that suggest that companies that have implemented cloud-based technology do not fully harness um, the benefits of that technology. And a lot of that starts with what does the underlying data model look like and how is that driving true business outcomes? So that's the first uh, concept or message I wanted to highlight here. The second is as it relates to these layers on the right. When we think of digital quality, we think of these five layers that really work together to enable true transformation. Specifically, again, to the example of data and what we're talking about today, I'll highlight the layer in the middle, layer three, and talk about that a little bit. Um, as it relates to QMS analytics and reporting, the tools and technology that are implemented for QMS analytics and reporting are only as effective as the data that you feed into it. And that is driven by a couple of considerations. First, most certainly is the system that's feeding the data, right? So one consideration is, is the data manual? Is it being fed periodically through exports and extracts from other enterprise systems? Is it being fed from a data lake and so on? So absolutely a key consideration there is where is that data coming from? But the second consideration and where the interoperability between these layers really starts to drive through outcomes is what is the standard or harmonized data structure that's feeding it so you can actually correlate and drive product insights across systems in a way that starts giving you actionable data related to a product. That then ties to how layer three on this slide works with layer two, those standardized integrated core enterprise applications that support quality, obviously the key core quality EQMS itself, but the enabling integrations that are tied to ERP, tied to MES, um, tied to complaints and, and so on. Um, I'll try to bring that to life here with one tangible example, and then um, we'll talk a little bit more about um, the, the importance of integrations and the importance of that standardized, harmonized uh, data structure there. So maybe with that, if we could pivot over to the next slide. I wanna use this to illustrate one example. When I talk about that interoperability between layers, uh, particularly in the example of the QMS analytics and uh, the product insights, I wanna think about it in terms of, let's say, um, a non-conformance. 
right? So when we think about analytics platforms that are pulling strictly from the EQMS with the data model that's present in the EQMS, right? We are able to trend NCs, we're able to look at various NC aging data, so on and so forth, and that's great. It gives us insight into the performance of the non-conformance system as a whole. That's fantastic. When it starts becoming really powerful is when you can then start overlaying that data with information in your ERP. Lots of you that are working through those digital transformations today are probably actively looking at how EQMSs and ERPs are going to integrate with each other because where the data from the NC starts adding value is if you can then overlay that with your inventory, whether that's WIP or finished goods, and make informed decisions about what to do with that inventory, and as well as then determine how the processing of an NC, the aging of an NC, which might on the surface look like a purely compliance oriented metric is actually impacting your inventory turns and what you're doing with that inventory on hand. So QMS data connected with ERP data through a harmonized structure starts to help you connect the dots between lots in your inventory in your ERP with what's really going on from a product quality and a non-conformance standpoint and how the two relate to really start not only fulfilling orders, but ensuring top quality um, to your customers as well. So that's, that's one of the examples here in terms of how interoperability becomes key. And with that, maybe I'll pivot it over to Christina to talk a little bit more about how uh, you know, we've talked about the why and the what, but how does integrating enterprise systems start to turn data into currency? Uh, Christina? Thanks, Vishaka. I appreciate it. So I'm going to bring this up just a little bit. Um, Vishaka, thank you for taking us through the actual kind of workflow of um, an, and an example. I'm going to bring this back up to hyperautomation, and this is something that Bruce touched on in the beginning when he was talking about where we're going and really what we're seeing in the market. And so hyperautomation for us is really about bringing the right tool at the right place at the right time, and I say tool but it could be a whole amalgamation of tools. It could be ERP that is, uh, has an interoperability with a data and analytics platform, which also has cyber, cyber risk, and then it, it could also be business process automation. So what we wanna do is start to seam together the landscape of data through a set of tools, again, delivering the right, um, process or the right bit of information to the right person at the right time. And, and that way, creating this real seamless consumer experience. And one thing that I'm hyper-focused on, not to, to pun on hyper-automation, is really that consumer experience, your experience um, as an end user. So what we want to stop is that really siloed uh, data structure that has historically been the architecture of um, pharma and uh, biotech, et cetera, we want to start to create that seamless um, user interface. I always like to say uh, I have a couple of apps that I love to interact with, and how do we start to repeat that in our day-to-day -day, uh, operations? So that's really um, what hyper-automation is. There's a couple of other things that we bring to the table, again, from an enterprise perspective, is we want to see things that are much more composable. Uh, along the lines of delivering the right piece of information at the right place at the right time, composability allows us the, the, the flexibility to create an application or a set of processes or a da underlying data structure and be able to reuse that in other parts of the enterprise. So that's a really important component from a high level um, architecture and uh, enterprise strategy perspective. Uh, we want to start thinking about decision, decision intelligence, too. One thing that we have is not only tons of data in this industry, but we have a lot of intelligence that we have to use to, to make decisions on regulatory intelligence, country regulatory intelligence. We have uh, business rules within uh, our companies. And so how do we start to embed those within 
um, within these applications and allow them to make some of those decisions for us, uh, maybe even a next best action. So those are things that we can do now as we start to see technology uh, and innovation in increase and those two things um, smash together. And then always, you might hear us talk about a cloud-based um, approach. And so that's really, again, one of those other trends that we, we talk to and we think about that um, uh, allows you the flexibility to move around that data and then get into other places where we can get um, standardize that data from a non-structured to semi-structured to structured data. So we can use all of those IoT data that Bruce mentioned in that first slide as well. So we want to kind of think about and look at that architecture a little bit differently than we have in the past. And so with that, Bruce, can I have you move or um, I think it might be Tom. Can we move to the next slide? There we go. All right, so what we want to do is really understand what the um, maturity makeup of your um, basic architecture or your best practices around data is, right? So one thing that we like to do is, uh, is look at baselines and look through uh, that maturity curve. And what we want to understand is if your data and is your data really uh, mastered? And so baseline, right? So that's that's the good. Um, are you mastering your data? Are you pulling it together? And we see a lot of clients who are, are in their journey on how to really define and master their data. Uh, that allows us, if we talk about those other trends that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, it allows us that. Uh, composability or allows us um, to get to that place where we're using data as a fabric, if you will, uh, and really starting to create data as a currency. So we want to understand what the base layer is and that least common denominator of data from a critical path perspective. Then as you move up your journey, what we start to uh, see then is really platforming the data. Are we ingesting it? Are we able to normalize it and use it appropriately with an application to application without spinning up additional integrations? Really important there. How can we get to composability as opposed to just spinning up additional integrations? And then really the best is when we have um, really just a data centric um, uh, makeup or architecture where, again, we're delivering that just-in-time piece of information to that end user with a seamless consumer experience. And they don't have to worry about is you know what's happening underneath of the hood. It's just happening for them. They can see things like uh, real-time dashboards. Uh, we can move from reactive to proactive or even preemptive um, risk management, we're able to really start to see and utilize our data in ways that we haven't seen and utilized before from a risk perspective, as well as a correlation um, or causation perspective. How do we take out our bias and let you know the data pretty much show us what's going on as opposed to us trying to figure it out um, or use some of our um, historical inertia in this industry to think we know what's what's occurring. So it really gives us that better perspective. And now we use data as a currency as opposed to our current state, which is just trying to cobble together enough data to create an Excel file. So that's the exciting stuff that we're starting to see in this industry, um, moving really from really basics of trying to master your data all the way up to being able to really contextualize it and get much more out of it on a daily basis than we have in the past. So with that, I think we might have another poll. All right. All right, so this is really, really around digital skills and tools. This is exciting for me as a, as a person who lives and breathes this on a daily basis. So um, that's great. Uh, it um, looks like we have data visualization as an important uh, AI, uh, master data, of course, then data integration and standards. Okay, it's an interesting mix. I appreciate it. And now I think uh, at this point in time, we'll pass it over to ETQ.
Thanks, Christina. That uh, was really interesting um, and appreciate everybody uh, taking time to answer the polls. Um, and so now what we want to do is get more into uh, a bit of the practitioner side of what it means to do data harmonization and especially with quality data and what we think about in terms of a quality management system as part of a larger enterprise ecosystem. And to start with, what we want to do is answer the question, what does data quality data harmonization even mean? And it, it really is about being consistent in terms of uh, your approach to your organization's quality environment. You don't necessarily have just one system that manages quality. You may have multiple systems that do different functions. And therefore, you've got data in different places. Uh, it's not just a quality management system. It could be your ERP. It could be your MES, your metrology system, uh, your, your learning management system, on and on and on. That data that could impact and help from a quality perspective is, is scattered throughout an organization, which leads to the second part, second bullet there, which is really how do you make sure that you have a single source of truth? You can't have uh, your, your, your approved supplier list living in multiple systems where different people are managing that list all at the same time. There should be only one approved supplier list, one system manages that, and then all the other systems that need access get it. Get it. So that's part of the whole uh, approach to what are we going to look at for how do we manage this data. And then having Common platforms, especially from the quality management perspective, will allow consistency from a process perspective and uniform high quality, but it even goes beyond that because when we look at a, a, a quality management system that's being used globally, we know that as, as Bruce and, and the PwC team have talked about, there are different regulations. There are different requirements based upon where you are in the world. Different countries have different uh, compliance requirements. Different organizations have different compliance requirements. How do you have a single system that can be global so you can get a, a holistic view of what's going on in the organization, but be flexible enough so you can uh, manage at a local level? So that leads us to some of the benefits of quality data. Uh, harmonization, because we do maintain a consistent understanding across the entire organization. We're able to leverage that same data. And it gets even more, you know, I talked about different uh, approved supplier lists, but think about how many spreadsheets we all have at any one time that's going on. And do I have the right version? Do you have the right version? Did somebody email me the wrong version? Version control becomes a real nightmare. And that means a lot of times we're working off of the wrong data, inaccurate data, and certainly inconsistent data. Therefore, having the correct version allows us to make much more informed decisions that we can have more confidence in, that we're going to be able to take advantage of, of what we know and be able to take quicker actions. And in fact, it gets to the point where you have these integrated systems where you don't need somebody in the middle to uh, take that action. So for example, uh, you can have a nonconformance in the quality management system, and based upon that nonconformance, automatically signal the ERP to put that shipment on hold. So you don't even have to uh, be in the loop anymore. Somebody doesn't have to look at it and make, take a review before some action takes place. We can take quicker action because we have the right data at the right place at the right time, and it can kick off some automated processes. Now, I talked about integration, and there are lots of different systems out there that can be integrated with the QMS. And at this point, uh, Tom, are you on? I think I you're am. out there, right? I'm here. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about integration across all of these different systems? Absolutely. So, you know, it's interesting when Christina mentioned how to master your data. What ETQ Reliance is, is really, it's a, it's a single harmonized platform that is used across the entire organization that shares common elements that make sense. So you have common fields, you have common information such as uh, data that's being imported from external systems. 
you can see the middle where the, the system is kind of the quality hub that can integrate with all these ex external systems to achieve autonomy. So with our platform, what you can do, a platform like ours, is you can configure it to attain composability. So Christina mentioned it has to be configurable to, to meet business process requirements. And it also, with the workflow and with the conditional processes and the workflows that can be built in, you can achieve that decision intelligence. So you could be real time pulling information such as product information or supplier information or any other information from external systems. And I'm not gonna go into all the details of what these systems are because you can see them on the slides. But the whole idea is that you have a hub of decision-making based on a common set of, of data and information. Would you move on to the next slide, please? So once you have that information defined, and you have the processes defined, of course, to, to the harmonized workflows and the decision intelligence, you also have the ability to do global reporting. So analytics can be used to pull that information together because you've harmonized, because you're sharing, sharing the common fields to mean the common things, because you've mastered your data and the same product is the same product across the entire organization or the same supplier is the same supplier across the whole organization. You can pull that information using a tool like our ETQ Insights to pull that together. And if you just move on to the next slide, there's a sample of a dashboard that shows how you can do comparisons, you know, year on year or by location or uh, across the entire organization geographically on the bottom right. So the idea here is that it pulls it all together. It gives you a single source of the truth, as was discussed, so that you can make better business decisions. The next slide, please. So this, just very quickly, this is a, an architecture diagram, but really very simply what it does is it pulls the information from the system, uh, from our Reliance system into our insights tool. It allows you to do reporting using any reporting strategy that you might already have in place uh, using what we call the quality data lake. So Power BI, Tableau, et cetera, if you have something in place, if not, you can use our own analytics dashboards. And I just want to refer back to something that uh, Vishaka mentioned about the overlaying of information. So our system is tracking things like non-conformances by product and by location, et cetera, whereas the, the ERP system has all the details about inventory, about the total purchased amount or the total produced amount. So this tool, this insights tool can put reports together to show you, you know, PPM uh, yield reports, et cetera, et cetera, using that harmonized data. And I think that's it for me. Next slide, David. I think you had one more slide there, Tom. Okay. So I, I already sort of spoke to this a little bit. The idea is that you're pulling information together from other sources. You're using web services to pull information real time. But once again, the, the whole idea of, of uh, automation is nirvana. You have better business decisions being made faster. You're not depending on people to wait for decisions, those decisions, as, uh, as Christina referred to, this decision intelligence has already been made. You already know what types of decisions you're gonna make in certain situations. So it's almost like you're achieving artificial intelligence. The system will automatically do what you said you would do if a certain situation occurs. And you can only do that if you've achieved the mastering of your data, pulling all that information together and harmonized your processes across the entire organization. Perfect. So now Tom and I would like to take a couple of moments just to give a few examples of organizations that have gone down this journey are still on this journey of harmonizing data across their organization, especially when it comes to uh, QMS. The first organization we wanna talk about is Johnson & Johnson. It's a global organization, everybody knows who they are. They've standardized uh, global quality on the ETQ Reliance Quality Management System. And they've been able to do this standardization across business units. As I talked about having the flexibility to make processes local, but still having that global view. Um, as you can see, they've integrated systems, they've integrated with SAP, they've integrated with, uh, with the FDA, in fact, to be able to send information back and forth. Uh, 
based upon efficiencies they've gained, uh, they've been able to uh, avoid hiring additional people. Uh, they've been able to streamline their processes and team members can really now focus on less of the administrative burden of just merging data. You know, how, how many times have we all sat down and taken data from two different Excel spreadsheets and try to bring them together, right? They don't have to do that anymore. Forget the VLOOKUPs at this point, right? It's all in the system and you can do the, the they can do the, uh, the images and the charts and the graphs that, that Tom showed. And they've seen an immense savings from this. Uh, their quality initiatives have, have saved them over $5 million so far in just a five year period. Uh, the second organization I wanna talk about is LumaLeds. They do lighting solutions. They are one of the global leaders in that. They had data in documents and Excel spreadsheets. They had over 900 different documents and, and, and spreadsheets in SharePoint, as well as individual computers. Uh, they had their own software that they built. They had, so they had data in lots of places. And what they were able to do with the QMS is bring all that data together. And it didn't really matter who owned the data. This is why we were talking about breaking down silos is because different folks from different organizations were able to input into that combined data pool. And that has allowed them to share that information, give access to more individuals, make sure everybody's working from the same source and be able to do better analysis of that data. They cut their footprint down. They were able to get rid of multiple quality management systems. Uh, they reduced that footprint by 35%. From an operating cost perspective, they're saving $700,000 a year. And this is really looking to the future uh, in terms of collaboration, in terms of continuous improvement. That's what they're, one of the benefits they're getting. And you can see that they also are able to do root cause analysis more effectively. And that's my cue. So Kimberly Clark, I'm sure that people recognize the name of Kimberly Clark, paper manufacturer products around the world. Um, they had facilities in 35 countries with sales of over $19 billion. They, need, they recognize the need for a system that could more efficiently and effectively manage their quality, environmental, as well as health and safety processes across their entire global enterprise. So they were able to create a shared quality process with environmental health and safety for processes like dot control training, qualification, incidents, non-conformances, meetings, audits, corrective action, that resulted in a unifying system that replaced over 600 redundant systems across the globe into one system, which was the harmonized DTQ Reliance platform, which yields tremendous cost savings and improved productivity. Would you move on to the next slide, please? The next example is, is uh, Wabtech. They were originally a uh, GE manufacturer or GE transportation. They are a freight train manufacturing organization. So back in 2010, they realized uh, that they had significant excursions and product failures in their locomotives that made it to customers in the field. So it was a huge issue. And the failures were chronic and the cost was over $100 million every year. So the company had no insight into what was causing the failures, let alone how to prevent them. So what they decided to do is they had disparate quality systems. They had 30 different tools across different locations, over 60 locations that made taking dealing with or remediating quality issues very difficult, very inefficient and ineffective. So they chose to implement and deploy ETQ Reliance in 2012 and they eventually implemented it across all areas of the company after the merger with Wabtech in 2019. And they consolidated multiple legacy applications into a single enterprise application with over 50 integrations with external systems. So they ended up with re more effective defect tracking that helped them adhere to regulatory standards. And the company's total cost of quality has been slashed by over 30% which translates in tens of billions of dollars that are being saved. Furthermore, in 2021, ETQ and Hexagon, who is now our parent company, uh, which is a global, global leader in sensor software and autonomous technologies, announced a partnership with us to help customers achieve product gains, cost reductions, and quality insights across uh, process improvements. So they 
kicked off a project to inf integrate what they already used as far as the hexagon metrology equipment to detect failures in their production process with our existing deployment of our system. And they realized what they ended up with was an integrated solution, which I think re Christina referred to earlier as hyper automation. They now have greater insights into their quality data. So with a single click, they can launch uh, a non-conformance report right from the quality data that's coming in. They have traceability back to the results. They can make better business decisions. And the idea is that it allows them to uh, be able to make product quality decisions more confidently and consistently, ensuring on-time delivery while improving product quality the whole time. So that's my part, David. All right, that's that's great. And that's, that's a, an, an understanding of how data from the shop floor, you know, from a metrology system and SPC can influence and impact how you look at the, the data from a quality management perspective. And, and this gives us four examples of real life ability to see where data from multiple systems and harmonizing and integrating that data really leads to significant impact to the business, not just financial, but operational as well. At this point, we're gonna go over into our discussion portion of the, uh, of the webinar. Uh, so um, with our friends from PwC, I'm going to, uh, I got a couple of questions here that I just wanna throw out to the teams. Um, and, and PwC, uh, Bruce and, and team, you guys talked about um, all this data and, and the direction the industry is going in. Uh, what are the challenges that you see today that organizations are facing with their data? I think it starts with uh, legacy data and the, just the sheer number of systems. Um, there's also a certain consideration there for the architecture as well. Um, I don't know, Christina, Vishaka, if you want to go into details on that, but those are two that come to mind immediately. Hey, Vishaka, I'll let you take data and I might um, jump in on in architecture in a second. Yeah, I think on the data side of things, um, you know, we've historically had siloed ways to define um, and master that data in multiple processes. Um, and now that we start seeing those things come together, there's all of that legacy information to wrangle. Um, examples of that might be, where do we decide the product number or the unique number should be mastered? Um, so that starts cascading through from a decision standpoint in terms of just uh, legacy practices as well as uh, systems of record. The second piece associated with that data is, is just straight up quality. And so from the standpoint of just recognizing that when you had manual systems, there was only so much that you could assure in terms of the integrity of that data. Now then being able to generate any kind of real insights from all of that, um, you know, sort of this uh, unreliable at this point, legacy data becomes a challenge. So when, when considering that, organizations tend to have to make that decision of how much of that do they then want to look at retrospectively, make decisions on what's key from uh, being able to continue to report, monitor, and take action, and which of that is data that um, is not critical from a business outcome standpoint um, to try to cleanse and to try to, in any kind of way, um, provide some meaningful, um, um, you know, e e evaluation of in order to be able to use on a go forward basis. So legacy data tends to be a, a challenge. Uh, Christina, I know you wanted to talk about systems, so I'll let you take that piece. Yeah, so something I'm rather passionate about is um, is creating progressive architectures. Uh, we have historically, you know, grown up on um, coded uh, on-prem architectures, and now we're seeing the move uh, to, as I mentioned earlier, cloud-native platforms. And this allows us to create interoperability and um, standardize the data in, in ways that we've not really been able to do in the past. So um, what does that mean? It means walking away from on-prem mainframes to cloud native applications where we um, have traditionally had heavy integration layers, middleware, 
um, and, and again, uh, standard to, to, to create standards within those data so that they're usable and then we can get analytics out of that. So we've kind of had this waterfall approach to architecture, if you will. Um, how do we really uh, get that more into an agile approach, if you will, if you can um, hang in there with me on those um, uh, on those parables there, right? So how do we move it into something where we're, uh, we have really the data in the center and we're utilizing current uh, tools in order to you know, bring in data. So now we also have this explosion of data, millions, billions, trillions of data points with IoT devices. So we have to create something that is scalable and our old kind of methodology of this, this waterfall approach that we get the data and then it gets into a, a data warehouse or a data lake or a data something. And then we take it out and we do something with it. And then somebody else does something with it. We still have really lived, really living in our silos. So we want to really get into the, into the architecture of it, get data in the center. And then that allows us to pull information in and out doesn't matter what the devices are, doesn't matter what's around us. Uh, we can still do all of the functionality we need to do on the backside of it because we fixed the front side. And so that's really uh, my passion around uh, more progressive architectures and moving to cloud native uh, platforms. That's great. And uh, Christina, Vishaka, Bruce, another question or part of this is, you know, talk about the challenges. What are the pains that organizations are seeing right now? <laughs> that's that's, yeah, a, just, that's just a, a few, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a big one, David. I don't know. Um, why don't uh, Bruce Vishaka? Why don't you take it away quickly? I, one thing I'll mention on that is just that decision associated with um, how much of that, you know, and building off of what we're talking about in legacy data. And what what exactly do you do? Do you migrate? do you you know uh put this into a data like what is the strategy associated with all of this legacy data so i think of one pain point that's being faced by organizations today is what is a meaningful strategy to you know not necessarily let go of all of this data we're sitting on but to continue to use it in a meaningful manner um while recognizing that it is from legacy systems that may or may not be representative of harmonized practices going forward. And how do you still actually get any kind of insights from that? So I think that's a big pain point today, um, especially when dealing with disparate, uh, decentralized, um, uh, you know, uh, and on-prem systems, and now considering going to a single cloud-based system. There's just an enormous amount of data that uh, companies are feeling like they need to wrangle. Bruce, any anything else from you? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll take a moment to put a, a non-technical spin on a very technical topic, right? It's overall just resistance to change uh, for companies that you know want to maintain uh, specific uh, systems or you know they have a set culture, right? So any change is going to be uh, show as a pain point or could be even considered a challenge in that situation, right? And, and, and on the proper buy-in from uh, from the leaders within those organizations to to invest in talent and the talent that has the background or has the knowledge to carry it forward. So a little bit of non-technical spin on that, but uh, certainly that's those are some of the key key things we're seeing. Yeah, and when Christina mentioned walking away from on-prem systems, um we've seen that as as a challenge and a pain just because there's some control that people feel they're losing when you go to the cloud and some other situate you know other uh, impacts of of not having the ability to walk into the data center and put your hand on on the hardware you know i totally agree and and just even in in the minutia or the tacticalness of this is landing on a term for a data <laughs> for a data set for a data field can be really challenging and if we're talking about mastering our data how do we you know reuse and that goes back to composability and etc so it's it's even just sometimes folks don't even know where to start there's so much right and um and landing on just a term for a term 
can be very right. challenging, right? Um, because sure. everybody's using it a little bit differently, or the systems are using it a little bit differently. So how do we how do we get there? Um, right. And those, you know, when you're down in the weeds, those are the discussions we're having to and getting folks to change. Um, sure. Can be challenging. Yeah, and Tom, I'd like to ask you uh, follow up on on what Christina just said. Um, where do you start? You know, how how are we solving this from from the ETQ side? Yeah, that's uh, th this discussion has been extremely interesting, actually. And I, I want to refer back to what Christina mentioned about mastering your data, because that's an interesting play on words, right? Because you have to achieve mastered data, but you have to master doing that process in the process of doing that. So moving into a tool away from on-prem systems into software as a service tool like ours and other, you know, database uh, centric tools that are that are out there can allow you to achieve that. So it's the, really the technology that, that makes it happen. And I, uh, you know, I've been in this industry for a really long time. And I remember when people thought that, you know, local area networks were cool, you know, so there's a lot of changes that have occurred that the technology has allowed to happen. So once you master the data, once you have common, you know, data across the globe, then at least from a quality management perspective, we see it as a, as a quality, we call it a quality journey. There are really four steps. There's the ignite step where you implement some of your common core processes. There's an accelerate step where you start to implement more processes plus start to integrate with external systems. Um, you can incorporate things like risk into the platform or into the processes as well. And then you can expand it outside to other ancillary processes like health and safety or start to implement your supply chain quality solutions where external collaboration because of the a system is uh, hosted in the cloud software as a service you can externally allow x x access to external users, for example, integrations with MES and limbs and other tools like hexagon quality control tools. So it's really a, a, a it's a multi step process and then finally there's transform where you're in the smart factory, you're in the digital transformation stage, global harmonization. So we see, and then, you know, the other thing that, that uh, Christina mentioned, I think actually Bruce mentioned that I was gonna jump on as well, you know, while it makes sense, as uh, um, Vishaka mentioned to what's your strategy for legacy data, what's the meaningful strategy, people are always involved, right? So there's always politics and it's, it's interesting, especially as you increase the size of an organization, how uh, how people can be resistant to that change. So you have to kind of get them over that hump and give them the comfort level. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we the, the, this group has a tremendous amount of collective experience that we can bring to the table uh, to, to discuss with customers and share other customer sit, uh, stories of, of how they've achieved that digital transformation and harmonization. Yeah, and it's, it's very true. Um, now, this whole presentation and this discussion has been around how to get to harmonize data, the benefits of, of integrated data and so forth. I'd like to ask one final question of the PwC team before we go into the Q&A section of the, of, the, of the webinar. What do you see as the risks of integrated data? Take this from the flip side. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's a great question. And sometimes it's tough to, to separate some of, the, some of the pains you see from the risk, but yeah, maybe starting with, um, you know, I think that there is a certain speed of which the um, all industries are going with uh, adopting different different tool sets, integrating data, and really, I think it may be going through the process of uh, prioritizing how you get there. Uh, I think there's a certain level of risk and um, maybe potentially starting, and maybe the thought process would be almost start in the wrong place, right? And I don't know that there's truly a wrong place, but certainly there's probably a level of, uh, I'll call it uh, risk management, so to speak, right? Where you can uh, ascertain the best best place to start from where your organization is. So I think there's some, some risk, inherent risk in just the approach uh, for organizations that are already in there. Uh, in that in that kind of mode of operating, it might be a little a little different. I don't know, Bashaka, you see any, any additions to that? Um, no, I, and I'm not sure exactly if I would call this a risk, but um, one thing that slippery slope, I suppose, um, is that you just run the risk of having too much data. 
I mean, you know, at this point, you are now sitting on being able to really report on anything. So how do you start then, um, you know, working through separating the wheat from the chaff and focusing on what's really truly important to your organization so you don't overload your people with a bunch of stuff that they now just have to look at and deal with and you're actually making true meaningful decisions based on all of the data that you're getting. So um, uh, I call it a risk if you will, but I think that there is uh, the possibility of sitting on so much data that it almost starts defeating the purpose of these integrations of, of being able to connect the dots by just you know putting too much out there for an organization to be able to meaningfully uh, respond to. That's a I... great point. <laughs> Sorry, go I ahead, might... Christina. No, yeah, and David, I might add one more thing to that, and it's mm -hmm. really on that slippery slope is um, is the wrong tool at the wrong place at the wrong time, and and some and we've seen you know we've all been in software demos and we've <laughs> been oversold and under delivered. So, and then sometimes we hitch our horse to that. So it's really important to, to get the right software at the right place at the right time to do the right thing. Right. And in the and right. Absolutely. And between what you said and what Vishaka said, I think there's also start slow because I, you know, the, the industry stats on software projects that fail, if you just, it's been consistent for years and years is up to 70% up to of software projects fail. And that's because you, you try to do too much, you too much data, too many different systems, too much of whatever it is you're looking at. So I would say start slow, do a pilot, you know, and you know, do some risk mitigation up front. So. Hey, I, I'd like to jump in if you don't mind for a second. Sure. Dave, that, because another thing that we've seen is a, is a risk uh, is people tend to try to over engineer things. They're trying mm -hmm. to overcomplicate the processes. And then what happens is it just kind of falls apart on its own weight. And the, the end users that are involved don't, don't see the benefits that they're looking for because it got mired down in all the, you know, I'm going to use the word politics again, or the individual resistance to change. So you try to capture everyone's requirements. Whereas if you boil it down, kind of like Vishaka said, what's the, what's the really the strategy? What's the meaningful information you're looking mm -hmm. for? What are the meaningful benefits that you're really trying to achieve? in doing global harmonization. So if you identify those high level bullet points, you don't have to worry about you know, all the individual details. In fact, you can always implement those details later if you just kind of look at the basics and try to implement uh, mm -hmm. you know, data integration as well as the, the automated uh, workflow-based system or something like that to achieve those objectives, everyone will benefit and you'll get to uh, return on investment much faster. Great. All right. So now we want to go into the Q&A section. We've gotten a bunch of questions. I thank everybody for submitting their questions. If you have a question, uh, we'll try to get to it. Please submit it through the, uh, the Zoom widget at the, either the bottom or the top of your screen, the Q&A button there. Um, and so uh, the first question that we have on the list comes from Alec. And he says, how did you go about evaluating what integrations solutions take priority? And let's throw that out to the floor here. So some of that is really dependent on if there's any burning platforms, right? So if there's any kind of urgent need that is um, precipitating, you know, transformation and there could be in, in quality, there could be all kinds of those burning platforms from um, regulatory issues to internal um, compliance issues. So uh, that those things tend to take priority. Um, past that, what we want to do, and I think uh, David or Tom, one of you said it earlier, which is take it slow, right? So really understand what we're trying to transform here um, and then prioritize based on the, the impact to the business, the impact to the company and the impact to, you know, the, um, the uh, consumer at large. So whether or not that's patients or consumers. Uh, Vishaka, Bruce, do you want to add to that? I think I think you you nailed it. It's I think if we go back to that PwC wheel we were talking about earlier, there's the customer or the patient at the center, um, and then there's a set of the operational business outcomes that we're talking about. 
whether that's competitive compliance and ensuring that we have maintained that compliance posture or whether it's ensuring reliable supply, whether that's a, a drug or um, you know, well, any other product really, there's, there's outcomes that your quality data is trying to help drive and focusing on the integrations that enable that are key. Back to the example of um, you know, whether it's deviations or NCs and then being able to correlate that with your ERP and connecting those dots there's a true business outcome there, not just in terms of ensuring patient safety or, or customer safety by not shipping out a poor quality product and being able to place the appropriate holds. There's also the aspect of being able to tell how the timeliness associated with your quality event handling is am impacting your ability to fulfill orders. So there are a few ways in which that integration is tends to be prioritized because of the high impact, not just from a compliance profile, but from an operational profile as well to a company. So there is an aspect of looking at the data sets to see what will this integration help me achieve in terms of my um, outcomes as it relates to customer needs, as it relates to my uh, business and operational outcomes, and that can then help drive uh, prioritization. It really ends up becoming a matter then of your return on investment of being able to really focus on, on those key integrations for success. All right, excellent. All right, Derek, hello, Derek. Uh, there's a great question here. So my organization has an ERP system that is notoriously difficult for us to use and difficult to migrate away from. Our QMS solution is all manual because it can't seek data with ERP except manually comparing data in Excel, which we talked about. I would like a QMS that syncs with the ERP system who do I talk to internally? So this is more of an internal discussion inside his organization to make that happen. And a bonus says cost matters. How do I convince senior management to pay for it? Yeah, I mean, I can maybe tackle at least starting on a second point there, right? It, you know, getting getting buy-in, I think I touched on that earlier, is part of you know, it's one of the hurdles, right? I think um, Tying it to business outcomes is certainly one element, uh, or tying it to, I think, um, the shock I mentioned this earlier with, you know, the health of, uh, you know, safety, health, however you want to put it in perspective of your industry, of, of the consumer. Uh, so looking at things like, will this, will this effort get me to market faster? Will it put me in a better uh, posture for, say, compliance if you're in one of those industries that, that, are, that are strictly regulated? Will it uh, help with inventory turns? I mean, so putting it into perspective of business outcomes is often the, at least the first step, right? Showcasing how will it Im impact revenue? How will it uh, reduce or, or impact inventory? And ultimately, how does that drive margins for the organization? Uh, I don't know if any others have thoughts. I actually would like to chime in for a sec. So you know, we, we did a, a webcast with one of our, our webinar with one of our customers who talks about speaking in the language of the upper management. So it's all about dollars and cents, return on investment. You know, you can get these soft benefits from implementing a system like this, but if you want to try to make, you know, convince your upper management that a tool like this is, is something that would be helpful and the services that we could all offer collectively is you really have to speak in their language and, and, you know, we, we, we and PwC can help with business cases. We can help take that, that, you know, ask and identify your pains and translate that into dollars and savings, you know, scrap and other things. There are many, many different things that, that we can look at that, uh, that achieving an autonomous solution like this with harmonization would, would allow you to achieve. And they're not going to budge unless you can convince them in their language that it will save real time and, and dollars uh, at the end. And we have this one customer I'm referring to has literally has an open door now with the upper management because they have proven that they would be able to achieve with an implementation like ours that continues to expand, that they would be able to achieve what they estimated would, would, would be able to achieve. Yeah, we're getting a lot of great questions. Unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to get to them all today. We will follow up with folks afterwards. Um, uh, following up what what you just said, Tom um, and Bruce, are there any measurable KPIs on quality data harmonization? How do how do you measure the value? 
So I think it starts with selectively identifying, um, I almost think of it from like a, a bottoms up top approach, right? So if I'm going to integrate these two systems, how well uh, am I now, how earlier or how better am I able to forecast? How, how faster, how much faster am I able to get ahead of issues? Um, it, you know, it starts with some of those conversations and, and obviously based on the data, how you're, what integration you're looking at, you know, it's going to have different, different impacts, but ultimately it all boils down to uh, better, generating better insights, right? And being able to react better, having, um, uh, you know, a touch risk management earlier, being able to be more proactive and getting ahead of issues. Potentially, um, you can translate directly. I think I mentioned this inventory turns earlier, right? So, if you're able to, uh, you know, work, improve in that area, you can you can actually have a direct uh, tie to a metric that you can you know you can physically almost touch, right? So, and that that's that's super critical. I don't know any other thoughts from the from the teams. Yeah, and I just like to add what it starts to do is create creates a horizontal not a vertical. So quality is historically thought as a, as a vertical. What if we turn that on its side and started to create it as a horizontal? So from a KPI, KRI, KQI perspective, we can actually start to see across the value chain how the business is performing, right? Because now we've connected it. And so those, um, those are not really just indicative of you know, the the operational or the quality, well, not just indicative of the quality uh, KPIs or the KQIs, now we can see operationally. And I love the comment, Bruce, from, you know, the bottom up. We tend to think of things from the top down frequently, but it's really that bottom up risk, um, you know, quality and performance metrics that kind of need to be pushed up to that higher level, that corporate level or enterprise level risk. And so now we're starting to connect it and create creating um, quality as a horizontal. Yeah, and I'm um, a last question, last 30 seconds, throw this out. Um, I think the PwC team should be able to handle this one. How long does quality transformation really take? This is a question from Harry. Yeah, I mean, that that's, um, it has a pretty wide answer. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'll say that uh, generally it depends on um, you know where you're at, how well your systems are connected currently, what what infrastructure you have in place. Uh, it, the reason it's sometimes hard to to predict, and it will change from from uh, organization to organization, is the the current infrastructure and the culture in place, right? Because it's not just a uh, implement one system and walk away. It's there, there's a lot of other infrastructure. There's the processes, the procedures that, that are that, that, that kind of build underlining. It's the the culture and uh, how talent is is built upon uh, in terms of that that system. Uh, so so it, it you know it's, it's sometimes it's tough to quantify. It, so it's going to depend heavily. Um, we certainly uh, have been involved in multiple situations where we're able to to go in and, and help an organization transform. So uh, that, that's obviously something that we offer as a, as a core, core competency for our team. Sure. Yeah, and one thing I'll just say in, in closing with that is that this is not a one-time event. This is an ongoing process, right? Um, think about over the last 30, 40, 50 years, how many times have we talked about digital transformation? So it's an ongoing process as technology changes and improves. All right, I, I, I said we have a lot of other questions. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have time to get to them today. We will follow up with everybody who's asked a question that we couldn't get to. Appreciate uh, the, uh, the interactivity with, uh, with everybody on the, in the audience. Also wanna thank PwC, Bruce Vishaka and Christina for, for a great webinar today, Tom. Thank you as well. Um, and appreciate uh, your, your joining us on this. And thank you everybody. And, uh, We'll talk to everybody soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Thank you.